Well, welcome everyone to the manufacturing workshop as part of the robotics roadmap for Australia version two. My name's Sue Kay and I'm the research director for cyber physical systems with CSIRO's data 61 and was one of the original architects of the first robotics roadmap for Australia. So first I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are all meeting today uh, and they are all very many varied lands and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, this is the original <clears throat> robotics roadmap that we released in mid 2018. And uh, it was the product of uh, uh, trying to find out more about what Australia's capability in the robotics space uh, actually is. And I guess our first attempt to put together something cohesive about what robotics in Australia looks like. Some of the recommendations that came out of the first roadmap that are particularly pertinent for manufacturing was about how we can stimulate the formation of new high tech firms and also how we can equip all Australians with industry for relevant skills. I think manufacturing is an, a very important part of the robotics ecosystem because we have both the importance of creating robotics technologies here in Australia. So we have sovereign capability in that area but also we have the very important task of making sure that we are equipped with the skills to allow our current manufacturing sector to adopt robotics automation, artificial intelligence technologies so that they can remain uh, competitive and productive, uh, particularly uh, after weathering the whole COVID-19 pandemic. So we'll be covering both the creation and also the adoption of robotics technologies. One of the fantastic things about putting the first robotics roadmap for Australia together was actually discovering some of the amazing things that Australia is already uh, world first at, at achieving in robotics. We have a great heritage in being able to do very interesting things in robotics. And what we're hoping with the second edition of the roadmap is that we will find even more examples that we can share with people. Because I think it's fair to say that in general, robotics in Australia and the contributions that Australia has made to robotics have been pretty invisible. One of the things we attempted to do in the first roadmap that we will continue in the second version is to actually map out the capability that we have in robotics in Australia. Um, this was not easy to do because the Australian Bureau of Statistics doesn't collect data on robotics companies in Australia and also robotics companies themselves are very varied. So it might range from companies that actually build robots to the service parts of other companies and um, to integrators, to the people that develop sensors, vision technologies that can be used on robots. So it was the whole, we were trying to get a handle on what are all the companies that are producing robotics, using robotics, and also developing robotics related technologies. And in that process, we discovered that we felt that there are uh, arguably more than a thousand companies in Australia operating in this space, employing more than 50,000 people and worth more than $12 billion in revenue to the Australian economy. So what does that mean for manufacturing? Well, I think manufacturing really is the flagship sector for the introduction and adoption of robotics. So before robots, you know, Ford was, uh, who came up with the first mobile production line was able to produce a car every six hours. Then when the Unimate robot was developed in the 1960s, that led General Motors to be able to produce 110 cars per hour. And things have only improved since then. So robots are increasingly used in manufacturing. I think the type of robots that we see in manufacturing today though are quite different to the ones in the past. But compared to most other sectors, manufacturing has a long heritage and uh, um, I guess confidence in applying robotic technologies that other sectors lack. So what's new for people in manufacturing where robots are concerned. I think that one of the, the key things, and we might hear a bit more about this later, and with the development of groups like the Advanced Robotics Manufacturing Hub, it's about how you can apply robots in new ways to help with mass customization and importantly, with reshoring jobs back to Australia. So increasingly we're seeing examples of where robots have been implemented in ways that 
allow companies to be more productive and profitable that actually helps to create jobs in the economy. So the purpose for doing a second version of the roadmap is really about keeping the momentum going. The first roadmap did a good job of actually raising the profile of robotics in Australia. And now we wanna make sure that we continue to raise that profile so that people know that we're not just consumers of robots in this country, we also develop a lot of robotics technologies. We also wanna encourage the right skills development because Australia's opportunity to apply a lot of these technologies is quite time limited if we want to enjoy the most economic benefits from that. It's also important that we identify where Australia can make a difference. We are a small nation compared to many, and so we need to be able to focus our efforts on areas where we can make a difference. And we really want to find, uh, continue to unearth the capability that we know exists here in Australia and share some of the wonderful stories of great work that's being done in the area. Ultimately, we would love to establish a clearly recognised robotics industry here in Australia. Now, because we have had to move all of our roadmap workshops to a virtual format, uh, it does make it more difficult for people to contribute. So the survey link that you see on your screens at the moment that you could also find on the Robotics Australia Network site is an opportunity for you to contribute to the roadmap if you choose to do so. So I encourage you after this webinar or when you have time, if you please just uh, go to that survey and give us your views on where you think the opportunities for Australia are in robotics. Um, so I'd like to thank my co-chairs, Phil Crothers from Boeing, Saeed Nahavandi from Deakin University, Dana Kulik from Monash University, and Corey Stewart from the Advanced Robotics Manufacturing Hub. And of course, we have uh, some fantastic guest panelists and our keynote speaker, Roy Green. As I mentioned, we have got a survey that we would encourage you to complete. And if you're keen to get a copy of the roadmap, um, you can also ask us for a copy. So I will um, post those links into the chat part of the webinar function. Uh, we'll now move on to the agenda for today. And first off, I would like to introduce um, our speaker um, who will be talking about the future of manufacturing, and that's Professor Roy Green. Professor Roy Green is a highly regarded champion of, a, of advanced manufacturing in Australia and is a leading thinker and commentator on innovation policy. He has worked for a number of universities and governments in both Australia and overseas, including projects for the OECD and the European Commission. His contributions to the sector include chairing the Australian Government's Innovative Regions Centre, the CSIRO Manufacturing Sector Advisory Council, and the New South Wales Manufacturing Council. He is currently assisting on the manufacturing stream of the Federal Government's COVID-19 Coordination Commission. Roy is Emeritus Professor and former Dean of the UTS Business School and has a PhD in economics from the University of Cambridge. He is currently Chair of the Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Hub, Chair of the Port of Newcastle, and a director on the Innovative Manufacturing CRC Board. Please join with me to welcome Roy Green to present our keynote. He's just gonna to have to imagine everyone. Roy, if you could see the uh, participants in the other room, you'll see that everyone's cheering for you. Um, you're welcome to share your screen now. Just to mention to everyone that we are recording this. So if people don't have an opportunity to join for the whole meeting, you will be able to see a recording of this and please direct any questions that you have to the Q&A function in the webinar. Thank you, Roy. Roy, you're still on mute. Try now. How's that? That's perfect. All right. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I'm very delighted to be here talking about um, this topic, which is obviously central to Australia's future prosperity. Uh, we didn't really need COVID to remind us that manufacturing has been in decline in aggregate terms in Australia 
uh, for several decades. Uh, in the 1970s, as we know, manufacturing had a very large share of our GDP, around 30 percent. That's dropped now to under 6 percent. Uh, and associated with that, of course, um, in uh, our robotics capability, uh, while we obviously do a lot of uh, significant R&D and we have some uh, world-class companies operating in the robotics space, uh, we have not seen the take-up of robotics in SME manufacturing that we would like to see. And uh, that will be a topic of discussion uh, for, for, for uh, this session today. But I'd like to just make a few remarks about the general state of manufacturing and, and how we got here. Um, clearly, the first uh, real um, blow to the strength of uh, manufacturing in Australia was the tariff reduction reform of uh, the 1980s and 90s. Uh, and of course, while tariffs did play an important part in developing industry in Australia, uh, they eventually became a break due to uh, the failure to encourage sufficient innovation and competitiveness among our manufacturers. And so it was an inevitable step in the 1980s and 90s to reduce tariffs with a view that adjustment measures would enable those manufacturers that could be competitive uh, to stand up and uh, be uh, successful in global markets and value chains. And many were, and we saw a uh, rise in the uh, exports of elaborately transformed manufacturers, that is the most research intensive uh, end of manufacturing. Uh, but um, the second blow, uh, I guess, uh, was our commodity boom. And uh, while this uh, very pleasingly uh, increased our standard of living, increased our national income over a six year period by around 15%, its other side, of course, uh, was to drive up the value of the dollar. And those companies that had become competitive in the previous dollar regime uh, suddenly found themselves in a lot of trouble. Uh, and even those that put a big focus on quality, design, innovation, as we expect uh, to achieve competitive advantage, just found themselves undercut, especially with the rise of uh, China and uh, the growth of low cost competition uh, from there and, and elsewhere around the world. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were uh, in a serious situation at that point. Uh, there was indeed a previous manufacturing task force set up by the previous Labor government uh, making various recommendations. Uh, it didn't really go anywhere. We had uh, various changes of government and innovation and industry ministers over the last few years. And now we have COVID. And um, this has um, exposed the, again, the gaps in our supply chains, which have become quite precarious um, and indeed uh, the lack of complexity in our economy, uh, complexity measured in the Harvard Atlas by uh, the research intensity and diversity of our exports. Uh, given that we're so heavily dominated in our export mix by unprocessed raw materials, uh, we have now slipped from the 50s down to the 90s uh, re really what, not just at the bottom of the OECD, but at the bottom of all countries around the world. We're between Senegal and Pakistan in the complexity of our economy measured in this way. Some might say that's a pretty narrow measure, but it does say that um, we've hollowed out our manufacturing and uh, maintain a first world lifestyle with a, a very outdated industrial structure based on uh, the high prices that we've been getting for our raw materials, especially iron ore, but uh, we can't say that that will last forever. And indeed, the crisis has exposed the vulnerability of, a, of an economy which is commodity based. And in that period, over about 25 years, um, we have seen a growth in our elaborately transformed manufacturers. It has continued to grow, but it's been well outweighed by imports. And so uh, the deficit in our ETMs is now has now doubled over that 25 year period to around $180 billion. And in addition to that, um, we haven't kept up with the rest of the world in our private and public R&D expenditure, which is now down to about 1.79% of GDP, down from 2.2% earlier in the 2000s. Uh, OECD average is around 2.4%. 
and countries like Germany, Switzerland, Korea, uh, many others, Japan, are pushing over 3% of GDP. And uh, if we're to reposition Australia's economy using this crisis as the opportunity, those are the sort of ambitions that we should have. Um, as far as robot growth is concerned, uh, we haven't seen much over a five-year period uh, compared with the rest of the world where robot installation growth has been a, a, over 50%. Uh, we're around 1%, 1% or 2%. It's just not good enough. And um, whereas um, countries like South Korea, which is the leader in this space, as uh, probably most people will know, has a, an installation of 631 robots per 10,000 employees, we're down around 83. Uh, now, um, that's uh, still around the world average, but uh, we need to be much better than that. So what are we doing about it? Uh, the government has responded to this crisis by setting up a uh, task force led by Andrew Liveris, former CEO of Dow, uh, a task force that has reported internally already. Uh, we're still to see the final report publicly, but we can guess really the outline of it, which will be to uh, increase the level of uh, coordination of our fragmented national innovation system um, in a report that um, I prepared for the Senate committee uh, inquire, inquiring into this a few years ago. Um, we, we found uh, that um, we have innovation spending across 13 different portfolios in Australia, 150 budget line items very few of which connected with each other. So the problem isn't just the amount we're spending on research and innovation, it's um, how we're spending it, what is the cost effectiveness of what we are doing. Uh, and hopefully this um, new report by the Liveris Task Force will address that issue of coordination. And we'll also address the issue of how do we, uh, and by the way, in terms of coordination and agency of the type that we see in other countries, uh, Sweden has been over, uh, Tech Airs in Finland, Innovate UK in Britain, Enterprise Ireland. These are all examples of how to coordinate and to develop industry facing uh, government bodies to uh, set the pace uh, in the private sector. Um, and as far as um, implementing those priorities are concerned, uh, we need more um, activities of the type that uh, the Innovative Manufacturing CRC is undertaking to uh, turn that R&D into effective uh, commercialization and the growth of export opportunities. Uh, it's something that we're trying to do also at the Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Hub, the ARM Hub in Queensland, uh, so that um, we can translate research into uh, commercial products that um, we in, in which we incorporate all the talent and ingenuity uh, that we have in Australia, and which is is documented in the um, in the robotics roadmap, and hopefully uh, will be taken further in the in the second round of that. So the Liveris Task Force may well look at how to develop collaborative industry hubs of this type, uh, and to ensure that to the extent that we're becoming proficient at startup activity that we ensure that that has a manufacturing focus and that it it has sufficient finance and uh, an innovation ecosystem that can enable those SMEs to scale up as well. And it's really the lack of those ecosystems that have made the difference in Australia. Um, other countries, Germany of course has the middle stand, um, US has Research Triangle and Silicon Valley and various other clusters of both manufacturing and business model and design activity. Um, we've lacked those uh, innovation ecosystems and that's something that um, we can uh, encourage with the right kind of institutional framework. Britain, for example, with the loss of its manufacturing has set up UK catapult centres uh, like the high value manufacturing catapult which have been quite successful together with foreign direct investment companies uh, in developing a smart specialization focus because we can't go back to doing what we were doing. Uh, we've undertaken a shift worldwide from mass production, vertically integrated industries to um, much smaller interdependent 
flexible specialization, smart specialization as the, the Europeans call it. And we do so now in the context of the fourth industrial revolution where automation and robotics is going to be central through the internet of things, uh, through um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, AR, VR, data science. Uh, these are all the watchwords of um, manufacturing industry. Uh, we may not in Australia become a leading robotics manufacturer, although we do have companies that are world leading in various areas. Uh, we have um, functioning robotics in Australia, for example, the, 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 the robots that are painting and cleaning the Harbour Bridge on a 24-7 basis that um, uh, were um, uh, invented in Australia. Uh, we, but um, even if we're not a leading robotics manufacturer, we have to be a leading adopter and we have to do this in the context of clever bus business model uh, innovation, systems integration uh, and human centered design led automation because manufacturing isn't just a vertical industry sector, uh, it's, a, it's a capability, it's a horizontal across all of our industries. And unless we get manufacturing right in this country, uh, a lot of other sectors are going to be severely impacted. So this capability building is uh, very important uh, from the point of view of the work that we're doing at the, the Arm Hub. Uh, and many other organisations across Australia. Uh, and uh, hopefully this session today can add to add value to the discussion that we're having uh, nationally about how to build this capability uh, across the country. So thank you. Thanks very much, Roy. We'll just give everyone on the chat a bit of time to um, get their thoughts in order for some questions. Okay, not seeing anything come up yet. So Roy, I do have one question. In terms of the robot population density, do you think it would help if we actually have um, an aim to, of where we should be in, in, in as much as, you know, if we actually put a number out there, you know, that would give us something to work towards and potentially some ideas, um, you know, the government might then be able to construct some policies or is that maybe not the right thing to do? Because I guess depending on your economic structure, it maybe makes sense for some countries to have a higher robot population density. Well, there's always that issue of we manage what we could measure, and uh, this is something that we can measure. It's not necessarily uh, an entirely accurate measure of robot adoption, but it's still a worthwhile one. I, I think um, setting a target uh, is no bad thing, as we would want to set a target for R&D as a percentage of our GDP. Uh, it's also how we apply that, and um, I think in Australia, uh, with the talent that we have, uh, we cannot just aim for a number, but we can do so qualitatively better than many other countries, especially in the context of linking robotics to design and to uh, our innovation system more widely. And in terms of strategy, China has a very well articulated strategy around robotics and ensuring that they have sovereign capability in the manufacture of their robotic um, infrastructure. And, you know, that led to them to purchase the European company KUKA to make sure that they could have uh, a secure supply of the robots that they need in their manufacturing sector. Is that something we also should be looking to do? That's a... Uh... An interesting question, and we, I guess we have to uh, recognise that we are a small country. Uh, we're certainly not going to produce all the robotic supplies that um, we're going to be using. Um, I think uh, the important thing for us is to be part of the robotics value chain, uh, to be smart specialisers in whatever KUKA is doing and in whatever other uh, robotics uh, companies of um, of significant scale uh, doing around the world. It's unlikely that we'll develop a company of that scale, uh, but we can certainly uh, use such 
robotics to reshore uh, a significant proportion of our manufacturing. Uh, one of our partners at um, the Arm Hub, uh, UAP, uh, is doing so um, as we speak, uh, reshoring significant proportion of its manufacturing from China because it's um, uh, incorporated advanced robotics in its um, uh, commercial activities. And um, many other companies are doing that around the world in the US and Europe because with uh, robotics and automation, of course, labor costs is not going to be the key competitive differentiator. Uh, it's going to be around quality. It's going to be around design and um, our innovative capability uh, and robotics is a, an important part of that picture. So uh, in answer to your question, we're not going to be developing another KUKA here anytime soon, but uh, we can be part of the global value chain. Now, Roy, there are some questions that have actually come up on the chat. Uh, someone asks here, do you see that we need someone like Elon Musk, but in Australia, for us to be able to progress this, or a different effort? Oh, well, we need a thousand Elon Musks, uh, and we have quite a few. Um, if you think of road microphones in Sydney, uh, we have our own Elon Musk or Steve Jobs of design-led manufacturing in uh, Peter Friedman, uh, who took a small family-owned microphone company from a few hundred microphones a year for gigs around Sydney to a massive global manufacturer producing 60,000 microphones a month for the world market. Um, he writes, um, made in Australia in very small letters on uh, the packaging that goes out. Uh, Well-designed packaging, by the way, linked to social media, linked to uh, design competitions. Uh, very clever guy, uh, but he keeps the made in Australia in small writing because he sees himself as a global manufacturer and exports most of what he produces. Um, it's hard to replicate such people, uh, but we do have them. Uh, Sue, you're muted. We've lost your sound, Sue. Sorry, thank you. Uh, <laughs> what are the barriers to Australia becoming a leading robotics manufacturer? Well, I think it's partly mindset and culture because um, we've been convinced that uh, over several years that the world belongs to post-industrial societies. Uh, manufacturing is a big, dirty uh, mass production activity that we should leave to low cost economies. Uh, that is so untrue in the context of Industry 4.0. Uh, and so we have to undertake a massive shift in our mindset and linked to the shift in our mindset is the priorities of government. Uh, the government can't pursue outmoded theories of comparative advantage based on the idea that, yes, we, we can uh, export uh, raw materials cheaply and buy manufactured goods from somewhere else more cheaply than we can do them here. Uh, it, it's just not a theory that works in the current context because um, we need increasing returns to scale from uh, uh, research intensive manufacturers, not the diminishing returns that we're currently achieving from uh, resource exports. Resource exports will continue. They will be a source of turning comparative advantage into a competitive advantage, which is based on um, our ingenuity and our knowledge. Uh, but um, we do need to uh, ensure that we have a, a more diverse mix in our um, manufacture in our whole export portfolio. And the role of government in that is absolutely critical. Uh, government has neglected the manufacturing sector. Uh, it, it has followed uh, orthodox um, theories of, of the market that uh, suggest we might not be as capable of doing manufacturing as other places. Well, uh, it, the, the, world, the world has overcome the tyranny of distance. Uh, everything in the future is going to be based on on data uh, and on machine learning uh, and on things that um, are not very heavy to transport. They can sometimes be transported on wires or um, in the ether. But um, that means an institutional framework that uh, puts a priority on uh, 
the development of our manufacturing capability and on the arms and legs of such a policy uh, that can deliver collaboration between uh, manufacturers, universities and government at the local level. And of course, CSIRO, which has continued to play an absolutely central role in this uh, repositioning of our economy. So Roy, I'm noticing something interesting and that is the more questions you answer, the more questions seem to emerge. So, <laughs> so uh, people are just warming up. Um, so here is a question from Michael. Thanks Roy. Do the countries that lie at the top of the table in terms of economic complexity around the world naturally have a higher utilisation of automation and robot adoption? Oh, that's right. They do. There's a, an absolute connection between uh, complexity as measured by the research intensity of exports and the degree of knowledge intensive robotics that uh, their manufacturing sectors adopt. And these are high cost countries. Uh, Switzerland is a good example. High cost country, around 20% of its economy is manufacturing and emerging high cost countries like Ireland, uh, which was um, in the 1970s, 80s, you couldn't imagine it as a high tech superpower, but that's what it's become with no natural resources of its own uh, because uh, its people faced a crisis, uh, its government uh, implemented changes, uh, the setting up of the Foreign Investment Attraction Agency, the setting up of Enterprise Island, the setting up of a very well-funded Science Foundation Island. Uh, you could say it was partly tax policy, that was quite clever, but it's no longer tax policy that drives it in Ireland now. It's the high skill level of the population and the development of its innovation ecosystems, which connect the foreign direct investment companies to the growing uh, high-tech SME manufacturing sector. Okay, now some more questions that have come in. Uh, the cost of automation in Australia will always be higher than Europe because many of the components of the system are imported and the machines are built by high paid humans. Does the government need to assist in equalising this cost? Uh, uh, most manufacturing ecosystems have some government involvement and uh, public private partnerships are definitely appropriate in this context. Um, it doesn't mean that we're going to be building very large um, industrial robots here. Uh, we'll be importing significant um, elements of our robot, robotic capability. But as I said earlier, to the extent that uh, we do manufacture our, our own robots or robot parts, um, we just need to build our capability here in our universities and in our TAFE sector. Uh, and in the end, uh, the costs of doing so, the labour costs involved, will not be as important um, as the quality and capability that we bring to that process. It's uh, really about high value manufacturing, not about low cost. Thanks. Um, another question here from Grant. What are the most pressing tertiary educational disciplines that Australians should be studying? Or is a vocational education training and micro-credentialing more important? Yes, well, this is a really critical issue and um, highlighted, of course, by the recent changes in the fee structure for different disciplines by the government. Uh, this is one I think that could backfire on the government because by increasing the fees for arts and humanities and by uh, lowering the per capita funding for all students in universities, um, there will be an incentive for universities to actually cut back on their science and engineering programs, especially because they have high capital costs through uh, the lab equipment and so on. Uh, but in terms of the question itself, um, um, I wouldn't say that there are any specific areas that are uh, significantly more important than others. It's the, the interconnection uh, of uh, the arts, social sciences and the STEM areas that will be the game changer for us. Um, we can train people in very narrow uh, science and engineering specialisations uh, and that will add value for a short time. 
but in the longer term, it's the ability to be creative, the ability to change and adapt, uh, the ability to reimagine the future uh, in connection with those specialisations. In other words, broad skills in addition to the vertical ones uh, that will be the key competitive advantage for a country like us. Um, and that means making sure that our universities are funded, not just in terms of their research, but also in terms of the um, educational assets that they provide uh, to our growing workforce. And do you have a view on whether it's more important when you're entering the robotics industry to have practical learning or theoretical concepts was the other part of the question? Oh, I see. Yes, well, both, of course. And um, they're very good examples of how this is done around the world. We've tended to keep uh, practice and theory two separate in Australia. Um, uh, we indeed keep our vocational and education and training sector two separate from our university sector. Uh, you have to make choices between the two. You shouldn't have to do that. And the point about micro-credentialing, which was also mentioned, is that uh, there can be joint programs uh, between the VET sector and universities um, that combine that practical training um, with theoretical knowledge. Um, there's some very good examples of how that's done around the world, particularly in Germany, of course, with its um, impressive apprenticeship system. A uh, very hard one for other countries to replicate because it's embedded in their culture. But um, the example I always like to uh, provide here is um, a small town in um, near Stuttgart in, in Germany, where uh, which used to be the clock making area of Germany and which has now reinvented itself uh, among its small and medium enterprises as the world's leading makers of surgical instruments. Um, using the, the wellspring of knowledge and ingenuity in that small area near the Black Forest, but in a, um, in a triple helix arrangement uh, between the university locally, uh, the businesses and the Fraunhofer Institute. Uh, so the university produces uh, students who do internships in the companies, uh, the managers in the company teach in the university, and the Fraunhofer does foresighting of the surgical instruments market to, you know, 30 years ahead, 20, 40, 20, 50. And so they know that they're positioning themselves way ahead of the rest of the world in ensuring uh, a competitive edge in that market for a long time to come. Thanks, Roy. And uh, Marcus has asked whether you can share some good examples of collaborative industry hubs from around the world. So you've just given one. Are there any other examples that you can think of? Uh, yes. Um, the UK uh, high value manufacturing um, catapult uh, is a very significant example. It's based in a number of centres, seven centres around the UK, including the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre in Sheffield, which brings in uh, anchor tenants, uh, anchor players like Rolls-Royce, Boeing, uh, BAE Systems, GE, and um, they work together with SMEs and with the local university uh, to um, provide an opportunity for those SMEs to become significant players in global value chains. Uh, similarly, the uh, manufacturing institutes uh, that were set up in the US following the liverous led Obama Advanced Manufacturing Partnership exercise of 2011-12. Um, um, Andrew Liveris, who now, as I said, is uh, leading our um, manufacturing task force here, uh, led a uh, an extraordinary exercise over there, much better funded than the, and more carefully thought out than our present one um, under Obama, which he co-chaired with the president of Yale. But it has five volumes of evidence about which areas of technological proficiency uh, the US wants to be leading in and which it felt that uh, it ought to abandon in the context of the technological race between the US and China in particular. Um, and um, one of the proposals emerging from that task, from that partnership were the 14 
USA manufacturing institutes uh, that have now been set up around the country, each one specializing in specific areas of manufacturing and drawing in uh, the relevant, uh, very high quality universities together with um, both new and emerging manufacturers. And um, there are some uh, other examples around the smaller countries of Europe, the, in Ireland, the Centers for Science and Engineering and Technology. Um, I was based in Ireland for a short time and saw how these grew up, including in my own university there with, with two great examples. One was the, um, um, the Regenerative Medicine Institute, which was set up in conjunction with Boston Scientific and, um, uh, ooh, who else? Uh, Medtronic, I think, was involved. Um, and um, those companies provided 40 million euros each, and this was matched by government grants. Similarly, another one, the Digital Enterprise Research Institute, was set up in conjunction with, with HP, um, heavily underwritten by government. So government funding has a significant role to play in conjunction with private funding in each of these uh, successful industry hubs. And uh, we have to think in just as ambitious terms in Australia if the Liberates Group suggest uh, hubs of that type. They can't be done on the cheap. All right, thanks, Roy. I think we've got, uh, I'll try and restrict it to maybe three more and I might try and combine a couple of the questions because we, we seem to be coming up with some some themes among some of the key comments. So just building on what you were talking about with SMEs as part of these hubs, um, Angus says that, you know, you've mentioned the need to work, work towards a higher level of coordination across Australia's innovation system. So what is your view about the need to develop strategies that drive collaboration amongst SMEs, fostering as well open innovation methodologies? Yeah, he, Angus is probably talking about um, the growth of industrial clusters, uh, whereby we have complementary expertise among different SMEs, maybe in a supply chain, maybe in a consortium to bid for a, a, a big government contract, and um, in that context, I might add, public procurement is a very important driver of these kind of activities. Uh, and these kind of activities in terms of industrial clustering can be done anywhere. It's just important to get the right types of SMEs engaged with each other and engaged with local research and educational institutions uh, to become a significant global player. Um, this is certainly what, um, uh, countries like Ireland or Singapore, Taiwan, Korea, they've all done it. Uh, and um, it's all about a collaboration, um, but collaboration uh, which um, combines uh, both complementary activities within the companies and the ed educational and research e expertise of the local universities or CSIRO. Um, you can't really do much um, innovative clustering without the combination of those activities. Um, and um, I think the point for Australia is that these are activities that can also contribute to regional diversification and growth. And uh, instead of sort of adding continually new suburbs to our large cities, let's um, try for some, if um, the French would call it dirigiste policy, in relation to our regions. Two more questions, Roy. It may come as no surprise to discover that there's uh, quite a bit of quite a few questions around venture capital. So, mm. it's, I guess one point is the struggle to gain investment in innovation that's not associated with mining, and whether that might change post COVID. But uh, I guess some of the other questions around VC is whether it's doing enough in advanced manufacturing and why not, and whether a large government fund targeted directly at developing a manufacturing industry would speed our ability to become a large producer of robotics hardware. Mm. Yes, well, all of the above. We certainly need the venture capital and uh, the super funds are the obvious source of that. If we wanted institutional capital available to the growth of manufacturing in Australia, uh, instead of investing in property overseas, why not uh, foster growth in our local manufacturing to add value 
for the country. Uh, government funding and government loan schemes are also important to that. We have very good examples of it in the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, for example. Um, and we need to, in this, uh, if we have a central agency to identify priorities, we need to identify areas where we can, where we have or can develop uh, future competitive advantage and build the financial institutional arrangements around them. Uh, obviously, we have uh, a large fund for MedTech uh, already, uh, the Medical Future Fund. Um, we can also do the same in robotics. We can do the same in auto components, even if we don't have a, a large car assembly industry here anymore. In relation to our mining sector, uh, we're very uh, well, um, we're very capable in, um, in, in, the, in the production of mining equipment. Uh, and we should be um, ensuring a complete value chain from um, the raw materials to finished products, especially in new areas of mining like lithium to gigafactories. Uh, this is something that a point that was made in an excellent report the other day by Beyond Zero Emissions, uh, emissions the, um, the, the million jobs plan. How do we uh, maximize the advantages of our uh, resources so that we uh, complete the value chain here. Uh, another case being uh, green steel uh, from iron ore uh, to green steel, whether uh, by um, the hydrogen um, method of reduction or another method, um, and in defence and space and uh, uh, renewables, uh, we have immense opportunities and building the financial arrangements around these is an important part of that process. And last question, Roy. Do you think it is more important for Australia to develop an innovation and robotics hub supported by government where highly skilled people can create unique specific industry applications rather than developing manufacturing specific robots? Um, well, why not? Absolutely. Uh, and um, certainly the arm hub in Queensland uh, isn't confining its activities to any one sector. Manufacturing is the obvious, but as I said, manufacturing capability applies along across across many sectors, quite apart from manufacturing as a vertical sector. And um, I think that uh, capability can be most effectively developed in hubs where collaboration is occurring, where services can be provided uh, to SMEs. And uh, this goes back to where we started, the low rate of adoption here of robotics. Um, why is that? Uh, can we step that up? Uh, how do we develop those capabilities and the confidence and the management expertise? Because management is an important part of this as well. Um, management has got to think about the future of their companies in a very different way in the context of um, global competition. Um, and this crisis gives us the opportunity to do all of these things um, and um, a network of such hubs uh, with um, maybe some specializations, but also the broader focus on uh, the, the um, service industries as well as manufacturing would be highly appropriate. Well, thank you very much, Roy. And uh, apologies for everyone who has been on the chat who wanted Roy's view on, on different aspects of this topic. But just remember, we are in for a treat next. We do have a panel uh, that will also be able to contribute to answering some of these questions. So please just continue putting some questions in the Q&A for our panel. But please join me in thanking Professor Roy Green, the Chair of the Advanced Robotics Manufacturing Hub, for his keynote and for his very patient answering of many, many questions. Thanks, Sue. Thank you, Roy. And I'm now going to hand over to Professor Saeed Nahavandi from Deakin University, who will be moderating our panel for today. Thanks, Saeed. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Saeed Mahavandi. This brings us to the panel discussion segment. Today we have four thought leaders as panelists, and I have the honor of introducing them to you, asking them to tell us a few words about themselves and their interest in this workshop. I will be your moderator. Uh, our first panelist is Ms. Chris 
Bridges Taylor. Uh, she's the general manager for BNR Enclosures. And uh, Chris has extensive experience in managing manufacturing entities and sits on the Queensland Manufacturing Ministerial Council advising the state government on issues to help manufacturing sector and be globally competitive. Chris has completed the owner's president um, management executive education course at Harvard Business School. Over to you, Chris. Ah, good afternoon and thank you for inviting me to the panel. Um, manufacturing is a topic I'm uh, very um, dedicated to. Um, my background is a, uh, I'm an electrical engineer, uh, brought up in a manufacturing family. Uh, our business is of some 65 years old uh, or so. I'm second generation. We have third generation in the business and one of the fourth. Uh, so as a family, we're de dedicated to the success of manufacturing. Our business employs around the 300 people here. Uh, for those who know us, uh, we started in the enclosure um, uh, solutions uh, business here down in South Australia and have a large plant here in Queensland and now manufacturing sites uh, around, around the world. Our proposition is, not, is about solving the problems of when equipment people and uh, wires all come together. And that ranges from very simple, repetitive problems to more elaborate, uh, complex uh, from design through to supply chain. And the sectors we serve is from the construction into the infrastructure, into mining hazardous area. So we face many markets, many customers. And our business has been inherently complex because we needed to uh, get enough business to invest in manufacturing uh, technology and skills. Being a family business, we have had a long term, we have a long term view and uh, a fairly uh, dedicated five year planning process, which used to seem a long time, but it's quite uh, short now. Uh, and when uh, about five, ten years ago, you start to look into the future and you see that. Uh, the world continues to change and that digital was clearly there in the business strategy. And about four years ago, we formally adopted Industry 4.0. But that was not the first time. Of course, we had automation and uh, our first robot uh, we had in a specific application was in around the 90s. Of more recent times, we've used uh, robots for welding applications. And then have only just this week are, are running a test case on a small cobot uh, application with Data61 up here in Queensland. Um, so that's uh, that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our uh, next panelist is Mr. Andrew Detman, and he's the national president of Australian Manufacturer Manufacturing Workers Union. And he's an experienced board member with demonstrated history of working in the government administration industry, the skill in corporate social responsibility, business planning, grassroots organizing, and many more. Over to you, Andrew. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Said, and thanks for the opportunity to be part of this very important uh, discussion on the robotics roadmap. Um, the AMWU, the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union, is a union of around 70,000 people and uh, we have been at the forefront of dealing with technology and skills in Australia for the best part of a century. Um, when I hear and in this, in this instance actually see uh, Roy Green talk about the decline in manufacturing, uh, our union and the members that we represent has been at the forefront of dealing with the changes and uh, the way in which manufacturing has been able to uh, develop or, in this case, uh, regress um, in terms of uh, of the way Australia has taken up or, or uh, failed at this point in time to take up uh, the challenge of technology. I'm uh, part of the Industry 4.0 Advanced Manufacturing uh, Forum, uh, which is convened by the Australian Industry Group. 
uh, I'm, I'm, I represent the union movement on that, and it's a really critical part of the way in which we as a nation are going to face up to the ways in which uh, technology and the digital economy are going to impact on Australia and Australian industry. For us, uh, I think the robotics roadmap is a really critical uh, part, pathway for us to be uh, participating in. Uh, we welcome the opportunity, as I said, to be part of that. Uh, the, the issue really is, uh, is, is all encompassing because it deals with skills, it deals with wages, it deals with the future of industry, it deals with uh, the very social fabric of Australia as a country which either is going to choose to become part of the high road of a manufacturing future or to simply be a price taker in the resource industry. Uh, we saw in the, uh, in the recent past, uh, in the 2010s and thereabouts, the impact of the decline of manufacturing and at the same time the increase in the uh, in the importance of the resource industry. The impact of that on, on uh, manufacturing was of course to see the, uh, the, the worst effects of dust disease where, where we had uh, a, real, a, a real downturn in manufacturing because of course our manufacturing products were considered to be too expensive. Uh, that was a temporary situation but it caused a massive uh, downturn in Australia's capacity to, uh, to cope with the needs of both uh, the technologies of Industry 4.0, but also the importance of working towards a carbon neutral environment. Uh, for us as a union, uh, we've responded in a number of ways. One is, of course, is to ramp up our, our interest in and knowledge and participation in, uh, in skills formation of Australian, the Australian workforce, but it's also to participate in things like uh, the uh, National uh, COVID Commission uh, task force that uh, Roy referred to extensively under um, Andrew Liveris. So we participated in that in representing uh, the trade union movement. And I've got to say uh, that uh, whilst we were disappointed with the focus on, uh, on gas, which we don't think is really the answer to our problems, uh, there is a potential and we're yet to see the response from government with respect to the, uh, the manufacturing uh, element of that uh, of the task force. So we live in hope. Um, we know that uh, people like Roy Green have been working very hard to convince uh, government, as we try and convince government, uh, of the importance of, of, a, of a technological um, future. And we also, uh, we also see, see that uh, robotics is a really critical part of that future. Um, I'll, of course, uh, respond to uh, the discussion, but uh, for us, uh, we, need, we need to establish some fairly fundamental issues, which is that uh, people uh, people have to be served by robots and not the other way around. If we can get that equation right, then I think we're well on the way to creating a, a, a new, newer, more technologically savvy and te technologically involved and engaged Australia. Um, and if we if we don't, uh, then uh, you know the, the implications for Australia and our society are quite major. Uh, that being said, uh, thanks uh, thanks very much, Saeed, and I look forward to participating in the discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our uh, um, next panelist is Philip Crothers, Professor Philip Crothers, who is known to many, and uh, also he's one of the co-chairs for this workshop. He's the enterprise domain leader for manufacturing for Boeing Australia. Uh, you would have seen the interview on Phil Marshall's Boeing towards the next industrial revolution. Over to you, Thanks, Aid. Um, yeah, it's uh, great to be on the panel and amongst uh, all the speakers here, Roy, that was a uh, great speech. Uh, my experience uh, is 20 plus years in Boeing in the aerospace manufacturing industry. Uh, I'm a technical fellow in uh, automation and in composites in manufacture. Um, in the highly specialised and I guess leading edge, we enjoy speaking of ourselves and being in the leading edge in manufacturing technology. Um, I uh, very much enjoyed what Andrew said there about uh, robotics serving people. One of the things in which we've uh, got in Boeing Australia that uh, was a part of helping start up and has gone very nicely is Cobotics and uh, all of the systems around it. So. Robotics to me means a lot more than just the hardware device. It means all of the other systems and industry 4.0 is a, a uh, catchword. It's a buzzword, 
I think over the last couple of years, people have worked out how to get value out of that, what it really means. Um, so uh, I'm very interested in cobotics and working and multiplying the skill of the workers and uh, going in that direction. And uh, worldwide, uh, I've been a part of setting up uh, research offices in the Middle East and watching the, uh, the Middle East and the UAE in particular use their oil money to try and set up industries after the oil runs out. So my interest is what happens to Australia after we finish digging holes? How do we use that money? Um, and I've worked and set up offices, research offices in Germany, so familiar with the, the systems over there that have been spoken about as well, and uh, worked with Ireland and the Advanced Manufacturing Centre as well in the UK and the Catapult. So uh, all very interesting models. How, how can we get Australia to take on such things is uh, my interest. Well, enjoy the panel. So thanks, Saeed. Thank you very much. And um, our next panelist is Mr. Paul Gekis. He's the director of business uh, for uh, Cardex VCA. And uh, he has previously has worked with the, the teams ABB Robotics in Australia, Asia, and the US, and also Scott Automation Robotics in Australia. And last year in the US with uh, Robot Works and Transbotics AGV teams. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Syed. And again, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be in the panel. Um, my uh, reason for wanting to be on the panel was to support the discussion around uh, the shift of thinking of automotive when we're talking about robotics into the deployment in SMEs and to challenge ourselves to look at how we can create jobs in the manufacturing environment by deploying robot technologies. And a number of our speakers, uh, Phil, lastly uh, talking about it's not just robots, it's the technologies around robotics uh, that we can deploy. And being an economic realist, uh, that we need to not just look at robots as being you know, the latest trend or the latest fad, uh, but how we can use sound economic arguments to deploy the robotics, robot technologies. And some of that may be in R&D uh, and let's say in, in the very high level world best practice applications, but others may be in much more traditional metal, metal fabrication areas. Um, as Chris has said, there's still a lot of robots going into metal fab, into welding, cutting applications. You don't need to be at the bleeding edge of technology to deploy robot based automation. So I look forward to further discussion. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pose a series of uh, questions and I would like our panelists to think about it and then respond. Uh, one burning question that people often ask, um, does, it doesn't matter what age range and so on, uh, is the one that do robots take away jobs or create jobs? And hopefully we can get to the bottom of this today. So uh, I, I would uh, like to invite our panelists one at a time to actually address this uh, question. So do robots take away jobs or create jobs? So I start with Chris. Uh, yeah, thanks, Aid. Uh, the question, the answer is that it changes jobs. Uh, and a business that is successful employs more people. Um, uh, I know Matt Tobin from uh, UAP, uh, who have put robotics into um, what would be a very traditional non-automated uh, area, and his employment has uh, increased since employment of jobs. And in our own business, we know that uh, as we put in different levels of automation, uh, the business responds, uh, we grow, we expand and more jobs come that way. The, as we look forward, I think um, the real opportunities for robots to make the jobs that are, that are available more meaningful, more interestingly taking away the more menial work and, and certainly with an aging workforce, assistive robots uh, that are working alongside um, means that the working 
uh, outlook for the older Australians uh, uh, can increase as well. Thank you. Uh, over to Andrew. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is really the vexed question that really uh, concentrates people's minds on Industry 4.0, and it also can be the point at which many people turn off. Um, there's a simple syllogism that uh, many politicians engage in when talking about robots, which is that they don't talk about robots. Um, because in their mind, robots equal unemployment. Um, and for many politicians, and also for many people, uh, that whole concept is one which I think many would, refer, would prefer not to engage with because they do see it as that simple, um, uh, that simple syllogism, that, that is robots equal unemployment. Um, I suppose it's not helped by some of the uh, critics or, or people who've developed the notions of Industry 4.0, like Fry and Osborne, who basically said that 47% of jobs would be gone. Um, I know that they've subsequently resolved from that position, but it still seems to get a bit of a run. Uh, the fact is that there's been many, uh, many investigations since that time. And uh, the OECD, for instance, did one about 2017, uh, Nettle, Cosca and Quintini uh, did a report where they said that the impact on jobs would be about 11 to 14 per cent. Um, I think that the situation with robotics is that it is a multifaceted question with many, many answers, depending upon the type of technologies that we use. Um, but what we do know is that uh, pretty much every time there's been a revolution in technology, there's always been a belief uh, very, that's, that's become very popular that uh, effectively we'll all be ruined, as uh, good old Hanrahan said many years ago in Australian <laughs> mythology. Uh, the point is, however, that of course in the longer term, uh, employment has actually increased and improved. Uh, I think the I think the three card trick to the Australian economy, but more importantly for Australian manufacturers and for Australian governments and 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 our society at large, and in that of course I include uh, trade unions, unsurprisingly, we have to get this right. Where we have to talk about robotics as a way, uh, as as has been said by Phil, uh, about cobots. We need to be talking about uh, people and and technology. We need to talk about digital platforms, and we need to talk about enabling skills of workers. One of the areas that I've been working in and in which there's been very little research has been the, the aspect of cognitive skills. Um, cognitive skills, of course, aren't those skills which, uh, which are possessed by robots. Uh, robots, of course, have lots of capacities to deal with algorithmic reasoning, but they don't have insights. Um, they can have programmed insights into them, but, not, uh, but they don't actually possess them. So for us, as, as representatives of workers, uh, we think that the skills of tradespeople and technicians, being a former technician myself, of course, I could have a bit of a, uh, a vested interest, <laughs> is that we, we, we recognise that it's very important for uh, those skills to be enhanced, for, the, uh, for those cognitive skills, about putting, be able to put things together and to, to branch out into those other areas is, I think, a really critical part of the way in which we deal with this question of do robots take away jobs? Thank you very much. Over to you now. Yeah, um, I uh, enjoyed what, the way Chris described it, the transforming jobs. So I can take the data point of uh, our factory in, uh, in Port Melbourne, where we've never actually lost a job to robotics. We've actually gained the, the largest contract in the aerospace contract in Australian history through uh, our adoption of robotics and automation and modern technologies. So we would have shut the doors 15 years ago, if not for this sort of stuff. So um, we've continued to pioneer in that way. And uh, Andrew repeated that uh, multiplying the skill of the worker has been very important for what we do. We've had the theories of take out the dirty, dull and dangerous jobs. But the overall robotic system and the automation systems now are going to help us with increased safety they're going to help us with increased quality and productivity. So all of those things will mean more jobs, more work, and a transformation of jobs, getting people out of the dirty, dull, dangerous. So um, yeah, the guys who we worked with, they were scared when they saw robots coming, but they all wanted to be on the controls of them, and they all wanted to work with them. 
So it's uh, been a change of culture in that way. If we can get that message out, perhaps the uh, pollies could start mimicking what we're up to. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, over to you, Paul. I'm glad that no one brought up the IFR data. So if we go away from our own experiences and look at the global data, as we said, we're not even at 1% of robots for manufacturing employees. So after how many years, it's still less than 1%. And the IFR data over the last five years in particular has pulled together a lot of data looking at and had a study a couple of years ago so Paul, the, just to clarify, IFR is the International Federation of Robotics, you mean? Sorry, correct, yeah. Bill. In, oh. International Federation of Robotics. Um, and again, all of this data is available online. So if you go to ifr.org. Um, but the, the studies have been quite clear that absolutely robots do displace workers. Let's not hide away from that. But in some, some cases, they may support a worker. But in some cases, there will be a direct displacement of a manufacturing employee. But by far, there is a greater effect and correlation between the, the increase of jobs because the automation essentially increases the competitiveness of the business. So as BNR, as Boeing, as many SMEs have found, and you, know, you can keep reeling off world-class examples through to very small essentially backyard companies that have deployed robot-based automation, that they would not be around had they not deployed robot-based automation. And it's as simple as that. And we, ha we can have a look at our automotive industry. So we no longer today manufacture vehicles. There's an opportunity coming up with electric vehicles that maybe we rejig our automotive business. We are still in some areas quite a strong automotive part supplier, for example, Nissan Castings in Victoria. But much of our automotive manufacturing has disappeared, perhaps because we haven't been adopting robot-based automation quick enough. So again, have a look at the data. The data spells out that yes, the net effect is an increase of jobs. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can put that question to bed now. <laughs> for once and good. Thank you for that. Uh, greatly, you know, answered. Now, uh, my next question is around uh, COVID-19. Uh, with COVID-19, do we need sovereign capability in manufacturing? Uh, I know our keynote speaker has uh, uh, touched on that, but I want uh, the opinion and view of our panel members. Uh, so again, I go around and I start with Chris. You're on mute. Right. Am I good? Yes, good now. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think sovereign capability just makes sense on many fronts. Um, in today's changing world, uh, needs markets change. Responding to those markets are going to be best met by those who are around you. And so manufacturers, the ca local capability will mean that local consumers will have best in class if, if uh, they're serviced by local. Uh, in regards to uh, major interruptions, uh, major disasters, uh, not knowing exactly what future demand is, to have basic co capability that can pivot uh, makes just makes a lot of sense. And for that capability to be available, it needs to have a base market uh, to exist on during normal business. And Australians and our government spend a lot of money. So uh, just the straight uh, shortening of supply chain um, with local just seems to make a lot of sense. Uh, also for the planet, I think one of the real advantages of the Industry 4.0, the technologies, and the ready access to the intellectual property that's available worldwide to be able to brought to uh, local manufacturer uh, combined with technologies such as the robotics, which allow for a much smaller batch size to still be competitive, um, has to be good for the planet. 
because you've got you know, less transport costs. You'll also, because you're closer to your consumer, you'll be producing less stock that then becomes waste. I mean, there's so many good things about uh, shortening supply chain, sovereign manufacturing, local jobs that is all being enabled uh, by technologies, skills, uh, and then it, while I have the forum, we throw on repurposing of resources, recycling. Um, for all of the, one of the reasons that we've used virgin resources is because as a community, we don't pay for the economic cost of uh, using up scarce resources of the planet with all of the efficiencies and the automation that happens. Um, it is now economic to, to recycle and repurpose. Um, so there's many, many good reasons as to why. And I think this, uh, this crisis has really given uh, economic value to uh, agility and short supply chains and sovereign. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Andrew. Uh, thanks. Uh, really, uh, the whole thing with COVID-19 is that it's brought into really harsh contrast the need for our sovereign capability in such a diverse area. Uh, I think you would have all seen the fact that we couldn't produce our own surgical masks anymore, despite the fact that Australia was a major producer of surgical masks. We couldn't produce our own respirators and we couldn't even produce enough hand sanitizer uh, to deal with local needs. Uh, I think that the response of those companies which were able to deal with that, uh, like Detmold in, uh, in South Australia producing P the, the P2 masks in a, in a very quick uh, turnaround, uh, ResMed producing respirators and a number of distillers uh, cutting over to hand sanitizers shows that there is a significant level of innovation and a capacity for prompt and timely action by manufacturers in this country. But for us, there's also uh, some, some really critical things that we need to do as a nation, which uh, reshoring represents. Uh, we weren't, uh, as people might be aware on this hookup, uh, we weren't uh, very particularly enamored of our free trade agreements, so-called. And I noticed that, uh, that Andrew Liveris, uh, likewise, uh, who has been mentioned before, uh, is also not a, a fan of free trade agreements because we think that what they do is give, uh, give artificial, uh, artificial boosts to th things like the resource industry at the expense of manufacturing. And at the same time, what we end up with is becoming a price taker rather than a price maker. Um, we take the prices on our resources, but we're not able to compete uh, with respect to manufactured goods. I think that reshoring has, and we know that reshoring has many, many benefits and advantages for the Australian community at large, but also for Australian industry, because if what we have is a much stronger Indigenous manufacturing capacity, we also have a need for more skilled workers, we also have a need for more innovation, and it doesn't mean to say we simply put up the shutters, but what it does mean is that we take a strategic view of those industries which we need to be engaged with, and it's not just the industries which are engaged with the health of our nation, but also in things like um, uh, the aerospace industry at Boeing, uh, and, uh, and modern forms of transport, ICT, et cetera. Uh, we, we also need to be looking at, well, how do we incorporate the lessons of Industry 4.0 into agriculture? Uh, agriculture uh, is one of the key users of technologies in this country. In fact, in many ways, it innovates. Manufacturing, I think, can be, can be engaged in that. And I think we need to create pathways to enable the robotics, whether it be uh, remote sensing technologies or others, uh, other forms of forms of technology and innovation, uh, which will enable us then to uh, have a, a greater sovereign capability. Uh, I think that we need to get our politicians off their backside to consider this. It's not just a Labor and Liberal issue, it's about all politicians recognising that unless we have a significant push towards a sovereign manufacturing capability in this country, as we used to have 25, 30 years ago, then uh, our, our position uh, as, a, as one of the world's most, most uh, successful economies will deteriorate very quickly. And in the, in the circumstances of a pandemic, and who knows if this is going to be the last one or the only one we see in our lifetimes, I think not, uh, then we're not going to be able to respond appropriately. And I think that part of what we have to do is to create those policies, create the, uh, create the uh, capacity for industry and, uh, and workers to be engaged in that and to develop 
a new way of thinking about and, and cons considering the future of Australian manufacturing as a key part of our future, uh, utilising robotics and, and other forms of uh, AI, etc., uh, that we need to be able to be developed to ensure that we have a future. Uh, and it's not just in the in the face of crisis. Thanks, Toby. And over to, <laughs> to Paul, uh, Phil, I guess. <laughs> yeah, Phil, over to you. So, same firing order, so we'll keep that going. Um, yeah, so I'm interested in a, a little bit of a different angle, I guess, is um, we've talked and we brought up hubs and uh, our own response in Boeing globally to the, the crisis was how could we pivot to our manufacturing to what we can do. I think the hubs, um, if we created them, would be, be able to uh, develop or know and advise the government on direct, okay, that industry can pivot, that those workers can pivot, and even help pioneer those things, pioneer responses. But that's a fairly short term, hopefully once in a hundred year sort of need. But those hubs, I think, can also be used, and we've discussed it in the last Robotics Roadmap, is uh, a national response garnering or responding to large corporations and needs from other governments or any other things. We need this capability in robotics and they put out a field call and this hub or can get the Australian industry, robotics industry, this sort of thing together as a national response and start developing the industry here and get more manufacturing and other things in another way. So just how we set up nationally in some of the notions that have been brought up as a part of making up that manufacturing capability. I think it could be garnered and really get all of Australia to get around that for a national response to not just pandemics, but any other challenge that comes up for national, uh, international manufacturing. Thank you. Over to you, Paul. Uh, I guess personally, the first uh, problem that I found when COVID hit was a problem of distribution rather than production. So couldn't get toilet paper, couldn't get a whole bunch of things. And there's absolutely um, a body of work that's going on right now to have a look at supply chains and distribution issues. But given this as a discussion on robot technologies in manufacturing, within the uh, manufacturing sector, the first issues that came up were the restriction on labour movements. So being able to move people into state or even to New Zealand, there's a number of projects that were held up um, and some of those projects have now continued on. There are still some projects uh, across the ditch in New Zealand which are being held up because you can't get people into New Zealand, whether those people come from Australia or whether those people come from Germany or Asia. So that was the first impact that would support having some local capability and decentralised capability. Um, as far as delivery times of the robot products and most of the technologies go, um, most of the time there was not a stop supply. There was a marginal increase in delivery time um, with some of the robot-based automation coming from abroad or the robot products coming from abroad. And most of that delay was caused by freight movements rather than um, issues with the manufacturing uh, hub itself. So again, some lessons to be learned there in terms of are we very reliant on a particular country? We've already mentioned that a lot of that manufacturing of the robot technologies is now spread across the globe. So uh, no longer are the robots just manufactured in a couple of countries in Europe or Japan. China is a manufacturer. Uh, there's several manufacturing hubs in the Americas and so on. So the actual manufacturing is not so much an issue, but deploying the technologies is an issue. The opportunity for um, plug and play, relocatable smaller systems, however, does give us a new opportunity. In particular, if we look at system robot-based automation, which are not monuments that require you know, several years to deploy, but rather smaller nimble systems, that also fits in with the shorter contract terms um, that are becoming more prevalent through industry. So I would say, yes, we should be looking at more robot uh, based automation capability and take this as an opportunity to change our thinking. Fantastic. I have, I guess, a homework question that I will put it to you, um, that how has the industry advanced since uh, the last roadmap? And uh, 
uh, who wants to go first? So how has the industry advanced since oh, the last roadmap? I guess uh, I brought it up in the opening uh, credits of uh, the speech is uh, since our last roadmap, I think industry 4.0 has become more less of a buzzword and people are working at what we can actually do with it. Um, there's more skill in AI and crowdsourcing of various things there and people are, oh, I can actually use that. I can actually gather data and be able to use it to improve. Uh, the sensors are becoming better, cheaper. Uh, uh, well, I guess um, at the time of the last robotics roadmap, we just deployed our first robot in uh, from Australia to repair robot uh, aircraft and hang off the side of aircraft. It cost um, a couple hundred thousand for that system uh, and took us a couple of years to develop. Uh, about uh, in about February this year, we discovered a uh, system on the market. There was a hand router from Home Depot uh, with a camera on it and some other sensors and it cost about two and a half grand. <laughs> and within two weeks, we'd proved it could do everything the robot did that we developed for two years and all this other stuff. So um, all these smart sensors, industry 4.0 is becoming a consumer industry level. And we're using mobile phones on the shop floor, all this sort of stuff, getting data, getting it all out with apps. So that's the major transformation for me. And that's why this forum means a lot more than just the device, the robot thing itself. And so all the rest is becoming mature and consumable for us. Thank you. So just on that, Phil, I will ask, and then I give the rest of the panel member to respond. Um, uh, you mentioned just using mobile phone and so on. Uh, would you be concerned with any of the cyber attack and cyber, because cyber is a hot word today and yesterday, uh, I couldn't help not putting that question there. And especially, you know, using those uh, mass produced devices that anyone else could have access to. Uh, anyone else want to go first or are you addressing that straight to me? You, the film first. Yeah, okay, no worries. Um, <laughs> So yeah, of course, cyber is a, a very big thing. Um, overall, not just uh, for the manufacturing industry, for about but uh, our products, as we're going more towards uh, autonomous uh, flying and other things like that, we have to really protect uh, what can be broken into. Um, and Boeing, I think only about three percent of our email is uh, actual content from that's from a credible supplier, 97% gets eliminated and cast away. And that was wow. before the maturity of the cyber attacks. So it's always there, it's becoming far more public, far more prevalent because we all have these devices. So as a part of what we're all doing, cyber must be what's there. And I think the government has recognised that and made that public uh, recently, but it's uh, a big it's a big go for uh, all of the industry, for sure, and all the consumers of the industry products. Thank you. Anyone else uh, want to answer that homework question for me? How has the industry advanced since the last roadmap? I would support Phil's observation there that the, without a doubt, the largest change over the last couple of years has been the the use of smart sensors, smart technologies to take robots away from that very structured environment into being able to work in an unstructured environment or with unstructured work pieces. It had been happening before, but it's got a lot more traction. And likewise, AI. So the convolutional neural networks and so on that used to be you know, something of science fiction previously, people are actually starting to deploy those technologies. They're things that many integrators in Australia have developed great systems and there is some world-class technology and developments going on within Australia um, that absolutely can position us in a fantastic spot globally. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm happy to have a crack at that, Saeed. Um, thank you. The, really, the, the advances have been um, almost crab-like in that uh, we've gone sideways more in, in, in many ways more than forwards. But nevertheless, I think that those sideways moves uh, do have within them the capacity for us to build 
a, a better um, a better Australia and a more technologically uh, engaged um, Australia. Um, when we went to, uh, as part of the Industry 4.0 Forum, we went to Siemens at Hamburg, uh, outside of Munich. What was seen there um, by the by the delegation was quite a, a remarkable uh, digital conversion of an existing automated uh, production line for pumps, etc. Uh, the two, uh, and, and it was a direct scientific comparison because, in fact, they had the two production lines operating in parallel. But what they found was that whilst uh, whilst the the level of quality uh, was higher in the digital, uh, the actual numbers of people that were used was actually about the same. Uh, whilst there had been some uh, some redundancies and retrenchments, the fact was that uh, that uh, the digital technology actually enabled a greater insight and a greater use of the skills of those workers. Uh, when I asked the uh, plant manager what the difference was, he said, well, we just have this uh, culture of training. I asked him the question, how will the, uh, how, how, do, how do the various teams, and there are a couple of thousand people in the, in the digital team, how do, they, how do they work at the training? And he said, well, they work it out themselves. Uh, and I asked him, well, how do you um, how do you control the budget? He said, well, we don't need to control the budget. They only go get trained on things that they want and that they need and that they can justify in the context of the production environment. I think that that sort of uh, discussion needs to happen in Australia because we, that will advance some of the needs that have been identified by, under the robotics roadmap. Uh, for instance, perhaps uh, with the imminent demise of job, the JobKeeper payment, uh, late in September, maybe maybe this is a time for the federal government to be considering whether or not the JobKeeper payment be actually directed towards training and retraining uh, the existing workforce, so that uh, those people who perhaps aren't engaged full time in uh, productive employment would be able to retain or 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 get get the payment for JobKeeper if they were undertaking uh, training and skills. That's the sort of thing which I think will advance the robotics roadmap in Australia. And if we can develop those cognitive skills that I referred to before, uh, then those really essentially human skills, which um, I don't think will ever be possessed by uh, artificial intelligence or robots, uh, are, those, are those skills which I think will enable us to be much more technologically engaged and a more capable and productive uh, society. Uh, I, I think there's, there's many, many productive areas for us to discuss and for us to create a new ways of thinking, both in in terms of what uh, business does, what workers do, and what government thinks. Thank you. And if I, I'll add from an SME's perspective, uh, as with the uh, technologies, it's no longer about the technology. Uh, the adoption of robotics, in fact, or the Industry 4.0 technology, it's not. It's about the market and the people. Uh, and combining that together is your business strategy, your customers, and and uh, and your management skills. Um, certain and certainly the consumer grade electronics has totally reframed how you use every day and how you employ uh, technologies. I mean, on, on our workshop in Queensland, I think I've lost count of how many iPads and iPods we have. Like I think just about most employ, you know, most of our workshop. Uh, would have one of which they're using to access the information that in the past they would have had to ask people. You know, the, their drawings are available, their work orders are available, they can provide feedback. And so for um, the changes for the workforce is that they're getting more mastery, more autonomy, uh, and there's been quite a democratisation of the decisions. So it's not about the technology. There's plenty of good suppliers out there with information. It's readily available. It's where does it fit in your strategy and and where what are your workforce practices and your skills availability and your future. Great. So Chris, while I have you, I, I want to address a question just to you. As a business owner, what are the challenges for adopting advanced manufacturing technologies like robotics? Um, uh, yes, I actually get asked this quite a lot, uh, and it definitely starts with your people. You, you, 
uh, investing and investing in the range of skills that you need of both new people coming in and your existing uh, employees so that you have the, uh, the perspective, the skills and the confidence to think of new things and then and everyone knows how to identify opportunities and then translate it in a way that makes sense for your everyday business. And then from there, it comes to get, you know, how, how do you paint a picture of the future and run a strategy process? Because adopting these technologies, in the main, many of them don't stand alone individually as an investment. Uh, there's this uh, case of uh, pilot purgatory, you know, they, you try and develop each one. And so your investment program needs to be against the whole vision and strategy of both what you want of your of your business, but importantly, the experience you want to give your customers, the workplace you want to be, the kind of skills, and then bit by bit you're implementing. And then the challenge is uh, there is the day to day. Uh, it's very easy to get knocked off a, off of a strategy just because you either get busy or you're not busy enough, or people change, or there's there's something. So we, of our most recent uh, invest, investment um, or area, have really focused on our skills around project management. I mean, we like to think we managed a lot of change quite well, but how can we set up our projects and use some of the lean methods in project management to keep up the momentum? Um, so that's uh, some of the, the challenges that we find. Thank you very much. So my next question is, uh, um, how is innovation best serviced? So um, who would like to go first? How is innovation best serviced? Can I pick at random? <laughs> <laughs> Paul then. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that one, Sayed. I mean, um, I, I don't know whether we should service innovation or coming back to Chris's point, and we've discussed several times that we really do need to have an economic focus on what we're looking at. Things do need to be justifiable and, and tangible. Um, and I'm not sure whether having a paradigm where we are focused on innovation for innovation's sake is the is the right approach, but rather how can we use innovation to best serve our, our purpose, I think, with the end in mind. If I, I'll just add, one of the best sayings I heard is, innovation is way overrated. Uh, the challenges are execution, you know, identifying opportunities and then execution. And if you look at the marketplace and what's needed to provide jobs, many of the needs are not leading edge. And yet we import product and we import service. So why is that? And I think it's around uh, how to innovatively solve problems and how to service customers and to bring resources together. Um, so it's balancing the classic innovation. I'm a big fan also of the Dublin work of Dublin, Dublin, where there's 10 forms of innovation and, and not just around the product or service. Thank you. Yeah, I'll back, back that up uh, well and truly in that um, we're transforming our tech strategy to uh, what traditionally you think of the widgets and uh, the other half has to be the method of delivery of, and getting the widgets into uh, actual operation. So uh, I don't know what percentage, it's got to be less than 50% of R&D gets into um, actual operation. And so innovation is best serviced by uh, greasing the wheels to get it in into production or getting into operation. And if, and if I could simply add, say that this this is really something where um, in Australia we have this desire to always try and pick winners. Um, the thing about innovation being the end result of, uh, of, of significant amounts of research and development is that uh, there has to be a freedom to fail. Doesn't mean to say you willy nilly advance a project knowing that it has no chance of success, but that there needs to be a significant level of investment. And, and I note that uh, Roy talked about 
uh, the importance of uh, venture capital and the importance in turn of uh, some of our major super funds of which, you know, the union movement's very, uh, very proud of the role that we've taken in setting up those industry super funds uh, to be able to get them to be able to, to invest. What that means is that we have to have a favourable business environment and, uh, and a favourable tax treatment of it. And the problem we have at the moment is that, is that we have neither. I think there needs to be some governmental decisions taken, which enable us as a country to be able to say that money will be made available, there will be access to uh, to cheap forms of capital uh, to enable that development to, to take place and that innovation uh, can then be serviced in a way that is practical and which then results in some great uh, new innovation uh, being implemented into Australian, uh, Australian business. So I think that that's a critical part of any innovation ecosystem and which we need to get right as part of that process. Thank you very much. Um, uh, next, I would like to invite uh, my colleague, Professor Dana Cooley, uh, to put forward the first question from the workshop attendees. Dana, over to you. Are you there? There will be a 10-second uh, delay. Double mute again, <laughs> something like that. Can you hear me now? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so we have a question from Hermos, um, and the question is, uh, what would be the panel suggestions for young entrepreneurs uh, in the sense of what's the best point of entry to the industry and where uh, young entrepreneurs can add the most value to the country's move towards automation and manufacturing? So who wants to go first? Oh, it's, a, it's certainly a difficult topic. Um, the best move for young entrepreneurs is to find your market and find uh, the best champion for that market um, to help you scale what you're doing. The government has some feeder lines, but uh, generally um, the government won't get you to scale. So you have to find the market and find the way to um, start making money from that market. Uh, with a partner with um, some method of scaling. Uh, and without the context, I'm, I'm not sure I can go further than that. <laughs> but, uh, do, you, do you think that they should have a mentor, perhaps, and, and to go and learn? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly, Said. If you want to carry on with the answer, you're welcome to join the panel. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a very, very good thing that... Uh, uh, to learn from mentors in, in any business, um, when you're first starting up, uh, you're young and anything, uh, partnering up with mentors in the area of interest to get you where you want to go is very important. There'll be a lot of people who have gone through similar things. Chris on the panel here in the family business, I'm sure that fourth generation is learning from the second and the first and the third. So, yeah, great, great really points on it. Mentors apply at any age. Yeah, yeah. Now there's reverse mentoring, of course. Yeah. Everyone wants to learn from uh, the person who can type you know, code about 30 times faster than them. Yep. Uh, how'd you do that? <laughs> oh, I'll see you in two weeks. They come back in an hour. Oh, righty. Yeah. How did that happen? So, uh, yeah, both ways. And uh, in this automate in the uh, industry 4.0 space, uh, the sweet spot of um, new uh, what new skills and old heads and old experience um, is a is a real value point. We're finding that if we can get those who've got the experience and the art of doing certain process, marry that with the young engineers and the young technicians. Both are learning from each other. It's a it's really fabulous. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, can I? It's Elliot here. I've, I've been listening. Just really one comment I'd like to make for a young entrepreneur is is the importance of going to trade conferences. In academia, we're taught to go to academic conferences, but the value of going and talking to a trade, going to a trade, and that's something that we have a problem in Australia because most of the big trade conferences are international. You know, there's big conferences, and if you can get to one of those, and I think. That's a really interesting opportunity around COVID is that perhaps there's an opportunity for people to do that remotely. 
but certainly the um, looking around booths and talking to people about what their problems are and connecting the dots is really, I think, a, invaluable. Over to you, Paul. If I could also add, um, coming back to that business model, there's a lot of people out there with great ideas, but they haven't been able to commercialise. So in terms of an entry point, I would say, don't only think about the technology solution, but also the business solution. So one of the things that's come up um, over the last years is robotics as a service, or how can you uh, change the business model away from a capital purchase into a provision of a service? And there's probably some great opportunities in that space. Thank you. Thank you. So I will actually, that's a great segue uh, into uh, another question that was raised uh, in um, uh, in the webinar. Um, so uh, Darren asks uh, if the panel could expand about upon how robotics as a service uh, poses a sovereign risk and how that might be offset by growing our capability uh, and leveraging towards robotics as a service. Who would, who would like to go first? Uh, well, uh, Sue's been heavily researching into the service industry, and uh, that's a big part of the robotics map. Uh, map, but um, it's a different type of service. I think we're talking there. The um, yeah, the uh, overall sovereign capability is that threatened. We, we have, if we gather uh, where we are, well best, and um, offer our own sovereign capabilities where we are well best and gather everyone together to offer that as a service to the rest of the globe. I think we have our own opportunities there, not just as a, a threat to us, but as an opportunity for us. Every crisis is an opportunity. So we can gather together and make our own aspect of that. So I'd turn that around a bit from my side. Mm. I would say that the the, the paradigm that keeps getting raised about this sovereign capability, bring it back to a sound economic argument as to what makes more sense. So mm -hmm. robots as a service is a great business potential. It could be a threat, it could be an opportunity. And I guess, as, as Phil said, figure out what our own strengths are and how we can make use of that opportunity so that it is no longer a threat, but we're actually capitalising on it. So in the current environment, money is relatively uh, cheap. Uh, so the, the interest rates are low. The, that coupled with, you know, in Australia, our uh, instant depreciation um, uh, stimulus from the government does provide some opportunities for people to perhaps set themselves up in this robots as a service environment. Um, and robots as a service may also spill into that area where we're providing the uh, technology aids or assistance for those companies that don't have their own in-house capability to move into robot-based automation. So um, coming from the state's pre-COVID environment, essentially there was zero unemployment um, and a lot of companies were struggling to find the right sorts of resource to deploy automation technologies in their own business and robots as a service or let's say automation technologies as a service was really taking off where um, people were being used essentially as short-term contractors in the gig economy uh, in order to get projects up and running. If, if I might say um, this issue, this issue of uh, sovereign capability is something that is a matter of choice for us as a nation. Um, we need to make a choice as to whether or not we believe that our sovereign capability can be redeveloped. I hark back to the period immediately following World War II, uh, where Australia engaged in what has been typified by uh, Stuart McIntyre, one of Australia's greatest ever historians, as Australia's greatest experiment. And in that Department of Post-War Reconstruction, which his book describes, uh, the whole effort was about what sort of a country do we want? And the fundamental position of the, of the post-war reconstruction policy was based on full employment. 
It was full employment. It was about utilizing utilizing all of our uh, human and natural resources to try and create a new Australia. And in fact, they they were successful. Um, the four years of the uh, of the Chifley government from 1945 to 1949 saw post-war reconstruction as as the, the keystone of our development as a nation, out of which we saw the creation of uh, the vehicle industry, uh, the aerospace industry, the glass industry, a whole range of manufacturing policies which were developed as part of that, and which then set up Australia for the next 30 years of uh, prosperity. So we have a lot of choices to make, uh, but we have to be bold. We have to say that we're not prepared to simply uh, wear, um, you know, the whole process of the uh, the whole process. Of, uh, of developing uh, developing something which uh, looks like it's just simply going to respond to the needs of some uh, theoretical international market or talk about comparative advantage or something like that. We have to create our own advantages. I think this uh, pandemic has shown that unless we do that, uh, we're simply going to be, as I said before, price taker rather than a price maker. And I think that part of that has to be us as a nation deciding that we are going to rebuild our sovereign capability and take up some sovereign risk as a result. But that we, if we can develop that, we are, after all, I think, what is it, the 13th, 13th wealthiest nation in the world. We've got the capacity to do it. And as has been said, we have uh, we have the, the ability to to remake ourselves uh, in a way that I think uh, that I think would surprise even those who saw foresaw a future for Australia uh, in, in the aftermath of World War Two. And I, and I think that uh, if we if we're bold and if we've got some Bold policy decisions and a capacity for creating uh, creating the, uh, the that process. Then I I, I think we're, we're we'll we'll be in, in in the box seat to create that the world that we want. Thank you. Well said, Andrew. Uh, Sue posted, "Create your own advantages." Uh, that's a great quote. Let's uh, use that a lot. And I would. So I have a I have another question uh, from uh, from our viewership. Um, so, uh, what robotics technologies does the panel think uh, are the most promising uh, are, and look to be be becoming the most popular in Australian manufacturing? Not sure on the Australian manufacturing side, but globally, I think robotics is certainly going through the roof. Um, the the use of smaller robots that are faster to set up uh, don't quite take the skill level as uh, uh, Paul brought up. The skill level to implement the automation is much easier. Uh, consumer electronics are adding to that and uh, the, the uh, advantages in safety and working beside people, all of those things are uh, definitely the trends um, that uh, are going around making it easier to work with the systems with, without fences and just assisting the worker. One area that I saw, Said, um, was the uh, was digital twinning. Um, digital twins really uh, remarkable uh, capacity for, um, for people to be able to work and service uh, really major components remotely. Um, uh, in our last trip, we were supposed to be going, the delegation was supposed to be going this year, of course, but uh, last year uh, we saw a, um, a, a technician, uh, well, an engineer in Berlin uh, assisting the servicing of a turbine in, um, I think it was in Tunisia. Um, and they were able to do that in real time uh, because they actually had the same technology laid out in front of them in terms of a schematic and also, uh, also a, a, a virtual a, a virtual turbine, and uh, they were able to troubleshoot it in front of us. Uh, I thought that was remarkable, and and I think that that's the, also one of the areas which I think really has uh, a remarkable capacity for um, for, be, for being able to transform the whole uh, manufacturing industry, because manufacturing, after all, isn't just the production of goods, but also the maintenance of them and the servicing. And uh, that's what yeah, the, so I think really is critical. You're speaking is, about the magnification of the worker skills, and in this correct. case, the projection of the worker skills. So it's a it's another mm -hmm. form. Yeah, agree very much. Thank you. Uh, that was great. Um, Anna, do you have your very last question? Or um, 
Yeah, actually, uh, I, I have one last question, and it was uh, in the in the chat. It was directed uh, at Andrew, but uh, so I'll maybe start with Andrew, and then uh, others can also uh, uh, respond. Um, so the question was, uh, as, as Phil had mentioned, that um, at Boeing in the Fisherman's Bend manufacturing site, when implementing uh, collaborative robotics, um, the operators have been engaged and supportive. Um, what are your broader experiences with manufacturing workers uh, embracing robotics or not? Um, when it's done right, and uh, and I'm the former organiser for the Boeing site uh, at Fisherman's Bend. In fact, I go back to the old government aircraft factories days. So you know, I'll, I'll, I'll admit <laughs> to my uh, to my prejudice in favour of uh, aerospace and Boeing in particular. Um, the, it has been that uh, when it's done right, uh, it's uh, workers basically take over. You know, they get so worked up and so excited by the machinery and the innovation that they can see, they will take over, and uh, and sometimes. Uh, and sometimes people in, in more senior roles become very nervous because, oh, the workers are taking over. But in fact, uh, that is just the best way of doing it. Because if the people who are engaged with it see it as something that is just that they just want to take hold of and just take off, then, uh, and I suppose Boeing's success at Fisherman's Bend and elsewhere shows uh, that that enthusiasm has been, uh, you know, has been translated into some fantastic uh, company results. Where it goes wrong, of course, is where a bunch of experts come in and the consultants tell you how it's going to work and everybody says, oh, this is a great piece of equipment and workers sit around scratching their heads and then suddenly they see themselves being displaced by younger, more dynamic, uh, you know, people people who are seen to be different from them. Um, and uh, that's uh, that's that's really, that, that can then be a disaster. Uh, so I, I, I would think that um, where, they've, where they've been done properly, um, that work, workers, workers just adopt and adapt and, uh, and create, the, create the new world for themselves. And, uh, and, and, that's been, and that's been my experience of it when it's done right. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So unfortunately, we have run out of time and I would like to thank our expert panel members for their participation and superb contributions. Now I pass over to Sue for wrap up and the next steps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saeed, and thank you to all of our panellists. Andrew Detmer from the National President of the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union, Phil Crothers, the Enterprise Domain Leader for Manufacturing within Boeing Australia, Chris Bridges-Taylor, uh, the General Manager of BNR Enclosures, and Paul Gekas, the in, our Industrial Automation Specialist. That's how I can't, I can't think of you in any other way, Paul. I, you know, you really were given quite a um, a build up before, at least within our um, co chair panel. So I'm very glad you were able to join us. So thank you very much to all of our panel and uh, thank you, Roy, for the uh, fantastic keynote. I, I think I, you can't see it, but you would not believe the length of the chat that continued to go on <laughs> after you'd finished your keynote and finished answering questions. It's, it's certainly generated a lot of discussion. And thank you very much to my co-chairs, uh, Saeed Nahavandi from Deakin University, Phil Crothers from Boeing, Dana Kulik from Monash University, and unfortunately she couldn't join us today, but Corey Stewart, who is the CEO of the Advanced Robotics Manufacturing Hub. And thank you very much for everyone who has participated in the webinar today. We have been recording the webinar, so uh, if you had any trouble following along um, or had to leave during part of it, you will be able to access that recording. And again, we encourage you, if you would like to contribute to the roadmap, we do have a survey that you can fill in. Uh, you can also contact us about getting a copy of the original roadmap. The plan is that our roadmap workshops are almost over. Next week, we have a workshop around the space sector. The week after that, we finish off with a workshop around the environment sector and how robotics is being applied to help us to protect our environment. And after that, we will be moving into writing mode and hope to have the roadmap finished by the end of this year so that everyone can uh, can uh, read it and hopefully we can see some positive changes. Um, so I've just already forgotten that brilliant quote uh, from Andrew. Yes, create our own advantages. So I think that's definitely yeah. something we have to do and we definitely have to do it before the end of the year. I think if we could do it next week, that would be awesome. 
<laughs> so once again, uh, thank you everybody for participating and uh, look forward to passing a lot of the information that we've collected during today's discussion and uh, putting that into the next version of the roadmap. Thanks for your leadership, Sue. Hey, thank, thank you, you, everyone else. Likewise, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.